It is Wednesday, June 8th, 2022, and we are here to study the book of Genesis together at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We are so glad that you've joined us tonight. We would certainly invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30 for a Bible study and then also at 10.30 for worship. If you have any questions at all about what you see or hear in our class tonight, uh, please give us a call at 608-224-0274 or send an email to Four Lakes Church at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. We've had some trouble receiving text over the church line over the past several months. And so if you have tried to text us, we apologize for that. Those texts have not gone through. We've been having some trouble with, uh, I'll just say with our phone provider, the num- the uh, provider of that uh, phone number, we've been working on it. I have spent literally days on hold uh, when all combined together, I would imagine, since uh, since probably the beginning of February when we realized that something was wrong. So we think we do have a solution, and at least we're getting close to that. So for now, I hope you'll either call or send me an email. It is raining right now. I'm recording this at about noon on Wednesday afternoon. And I've mentioned before how sensitive the microphone is. I can hear water going through the gutter on the outside of the house. I hope that's not too annoying to you if you can hear that. And uh, my daughter's here working from home today, and it's probably about lunchtime. So if you hear footsteps on the stairs, if you hear doors closing or uh, water running or whatever, if you hear a beagle going uh, just uh, berserk at the at the mailman, just uh, that's the way it is right now. But uh, anyway, welcome to our class. I just want to say briefly tonight as we get started, I've enjoyed having my sister in town over the past couple weeks. Uh, I hope you got to meet her this past Lord's Day at, uh, at the worship assembly. We've accomplished some projects at my parents' house. And uh, Monday, we enjoyed hitting some thrift stores together. If you follow me on Facebook, you already know that. I put a picture of the map on there. I think we did 14 out of the 20 major thrift stores in the Madison area. And we are aiming for the remaining six tomorrow before she heads home to the Pacific Northwest. So I'm looking forward to that. And it has been very good having her uh, with us for a couple weeks here. Uh, Tonight, we are getting back to our study of the book of Genesis. So as we've studied, uh, Genesis is a book of beginnings written primarily by Moses. And tonight, we are continuing in our study of the flood in Genesis chapter 7. So we're right in the middle of uh, three or four chapters concerning the flood. Last week in chapter 6, we learned that pretty much everything on earth had turned evil. Uh, with the exception of Noah, a righteous man. And so God commands Noah, therefore, to build an ark, which is basically a huge barge. And he is to do this in order to prepare for a worldwide flood. And God gives some very specific instructions. And in the last verse of chapter 6, Moses, the author of this passage, many years later says, Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. And I think that phrase is repeated a few times concerning the life of Noah. So a very righteous man who was very good at following God's directions. So that brings us then tonight to Genesis chapter 7. And the first paragraph is Genesis chapter 7 verses 1 through 5. So it'll be on your screen. Uh, If you're not able to read that, of course, uh, also, it's just better if you can have it open on your own device. If you're able to take notes or flip around, go from passage to passage, that would be great. But Genesis chapter 7, and the first uh, section here is verses 1 through 5. Genesis 7, 1 through 5. Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. You shall take with you of every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and his female. Also of the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days I will send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made." Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. Starting in verse 1 then, we have this reminder that Noah is the only righteous man on the face of the earth at this time. And I know I read this passage and I read through these few chapters here and I sometimes wonder, what about Noah's sons? Are they also righteous or are they evil? And you know, I sometimes wonder about them, and, and if they are not righteous, then why are they allowed on the ark while everybody else is not? And so I, I don't know if that's crossed your mind at all, with Noah being the only righteous man on the face of the earth. Well, what about his sons, and why are they on the ark? 
And so if they're not righteous, then why are they saved along with Noah? And as I see it, I think we have two main possibilities here, at least as I've tried to reason through this. See what you think about this and let me know. You know, one possibility is they are righteous. And they fall into the Noah category. So it's not that Moses is wrong here about Noah being the only righteous man on the face of the earth. But rather, we might say that uh, Moses is speaking collectively of not just Noah the man as an individual, but he's speaking of Noah and his family. So not just Noah, uh, but Noah and his people, or maybe those under his influence or those in his household. I know we refer to this section of the Bible and the events in it as the patriarchal age, the patriarchs, the um, families that were ruled by the fathers and God communicated to the fathers. So maybe he's speaking in that sense that Noah is the head of his family. And so, yes, he's righteous, but so are his sons uh, due to his good influence. But then the other possibility is this. If they are not righteous, then God saves them under Noah's umbrella, so to speak. And I use the word umbrella there and then realize we're about to talk about a flood. So maybe it's more important than I originally intended or more relevant. So even though they may not be deserving of salvation, if we want to put it in those terms, they're still saved despite that due to Noah's influence or due to his protection over them. And personally, I'm not really sure which way to go here. I think I would lean toward option number one. But then again, we may have a clue in a week or two as we come to an interesting, very sad incident that takes place immediately after the flood, where the door cracks open a little bit and we do, in fact, learn something about Noah's sons and their character. But we'll get to that in a few weeks. But for now, though, God tells Noah it's time to get on the ark along with his household. And the fact that Noah is saved is tied to his righteousness. So this isn't some random thing. God doesn't just say, you know, pick a number between one and a billion, and if you get the number you're in, that's not what's going on here. Noah did have something to do with this, not that he saves himself, but he did play some role in maybe, I don't know, attracting God's attention with his righteous behavior, something along those lines. Uh, if you remember, we learned from Genesis 6-8 that Noah found favor or grace in the eyes of God. Uh, but God commands, Noah obeys, resulting ultimately in Noah's salvation on the ark. And of course, if Noah had not obeyed over the past 120 years, uh, there would not have been an ark to enter. So that's something we should probably consider here as well. So uh, he was working with God on this. In verse number two, God tells Noah that in addition to taking two of each kind of animal on the ark, a male and a female, he is also to take as I understand this, seven pairs of every clean animal. And I think this is new information. I don't believe we had this back in chapter six. So, you know, now the question is, why take extra of the clean animals? Well, we're not really told specifically here. We do know that the clean animals were the animals that could be sacrificed, at least later under the law of Moses. We don't have much detail on this here and now. Uh, we will see Noah make a sacrifice when the flood is over, which is interesting. And I, I hesitate to spoil this if you didn't know this already, but they're going to survive this thing. And it would be a real shame, wouldn't it, to get off the ark and to make an animal sacrifice and then have this big oops moment. <laughs> we just caused an immediate extinction event because these were the only two left and I just killed one to order in order to say thank you to God for saving us. That'd be a terrible thing to happen. And so instead of just two of each animal, Noah is to take seven pairs extra of the clean animals. And I believe that this is to allow for animal sacrifice uh, when this whole thing is over. So again, I wouldn't swear to that. I don't swear to anything really, but uh, I'm just saying that's my opinion. That's uh, uh, my conclusion on this. If you have something different, let me know uh, as to why there would be extra animals that are in this clean category. And uh, the purpose, according to the end of verse 3, is to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. So that is the ultimate goal here, is to bring a sampling of all these animals. And then, of course, extras of the clean animals for whatever reason, which we think is tied to sacrifice, although it's not specifically stated here. Um, in verse 4, God gives the reminder that... Uh, he is about to send rain on the earth to destroy every living thing. This will happen seven days from now, so seven days down the line from uh, this event. And just a note on this, what is the significance of seven days here? You know, why didn't God say, in six days I'm going to do this, or in two weeks, or a month from now? Why seven days? Well, seven days is a week. And as we learned a few weeks ago in Genesis 2, there's no scientific explanation for a week. 
other than the fact that God made everything in six days and rested on the seventh. So, as we discussed a few weeks ago, we can explain days scientifically, we can explain months, we can explain years scientifically based on rotations and orbits and, and all of that. But as we learned a few weeks ago, there is no scientific explanation for why we divide time into weeks. So I would simply take this as a reminder from God, just as he created everything in a week, so also the destruction will begin one week from when he makes this last announcement or this last warning, we might say, to Noah. Uh, this, by the way, is the first reference to rain that is about to happen in the Bible. The only other use of the word rain before this goes back to Genesis 2.5, where the text says that no shrub of the field was yet in the earth and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. If you remember, um, the plants used to get watered from the mist that would rise up from the ground. And so this rain, these drops of water falling from the sky, this is to be a brand new event, having never happened before. This would be an amazing thing. Rain has never been seen up to this point. And so this would be a, a new and bizarre thing for these people to, uh, to see. Uh, then in verse 5, we have the reminder that Noah obeys the Lord. So once again, in the Bible, we find Noah does according to all that the Lord had commanded him. So let's continue on then with Genesis chapter 7, verses 6 through 12. The next paragraph, Genesis 7, verses 6 through 12. Now Noah was 600 years old when the flood of water came upon the earth, then Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him entered the ark because of the water of the flood. Of clean animals and animals that are not clean and birds and everything that creeps on the ground, there went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. It came about after the seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day that all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were opened, the rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. In verse 6, notice we find that Noah is 600 years old at this point. Um, I remember hearing from... Uh, I don't know, old guys, fellow old guys, not sure how to say that exactly now. You know, if I knew I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. <laughs> and uh, maybe Noah's thinking the same thing here. I saw a meme a while back that uh, said something to the effect, you know, stay fit and healthy in your old age. You never know when you're 600 years old, God might ask you to build an ark, that kind of thing. Oh, but nevertheless, he's 600 years old. They get on the ark just as God had commanded. Then the flood begins in the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month on the 17th day of the month. And one of the commentaries, a couple of the commentaries, in fact, were pointing out here. It almost sounds like an eyewitness account. And I'm thinking Captain's Log, Stardate, whatever, if you know what I'm talking about, Star Trek, where they Captain's Log, he makes this these entries. And to me, it almost sounds like that. Uh, uh, the, the captain of a ship taking notes and writing this down. This is, you know, the 600th year of my life in the second month, the 17th day of the month. It's kind of a strange thing to know because ultimately for us, I, I'm not really concerned about this exactly. You know, what year or what day or what day of the month this happens or whatever. But it was important to Noah. And apparently, just speculating here, he seems to have maybe taken notes on this. And maybe Moses is basing this obviously on inspiration. But there's a chance he's got a, a written record of this, that he has access uh, to this source material. But the, the fountains of the great deep burst open. The floodgates of the sky are opened. And it starts raining, and it continues raining for 40 days and 40 nights. And I know we have quite a few numbers and dates here. And you know I am not good with numbers and the chronologies like that. It, you know, any, it gets complicated. Numbers and, and letters should never mix, in my humble opinion. I know a lot of you disagree for good reason, and you, you know what you're doing. Um, but this helps me. I'm including a chart from the Beacon Bible Commentary. This goes back many years. And uh, this is from their commentary on this passage. And this chart has helped me understand the chronology of the flood for many, many years. And I, I remember looking at this back when I was in probably middle school or high school in a Bible class down at the Crystal Lake Congregation down in the suburbs of Chicago. And I know growing up from what we hear, the songs that we sing, it's very easy for us to assume that the flood was 40 days and 40 nights. Noah and the animals get on the ark, it rains 40 days and 40 nights, and they get off the ark. Have any of you ever thought that? 
when I was a kid, I kind of thought the flood lasted 40 days. They were on the boat for 40 days. So just a month and a half, it's not too bad or whatever. Well, not realizing that it was actually a whole lot more than that. And so when we actually read the actual verses of the actual Bible, we start to have our eyes open. This was a year-long event, just over a year from beginning to end. And I realize the print is rather small with the way it's laid out uh, for a vertical page in a book, not a PowerPoint slide. And I actually probably spent half an hour earlier today trying to make this on my own. <laughs> and yeah, I typed it all in and the the formatting got really difficult. As you can imagine, we've got all kinds of stuff, different columns going on here, and you got vertical um, graphics and, and all that. And it's not pretty the way it is, but even this is a whole lot better than what I ended up with. So I quit halfway through that and just gave up and uh, took a picture of it, and put it in here. So I want to gray out or maybe blue out most of the chart. I just Blue was random. That was the first box that popped up, which may be appropriate. It almost looks like water rising on this chart. But uh, I'll, I'll blue out or I'll gray out most of it just to show where we are on here. Um, on the chart, we've just seen God's announcement that the flood will take place in seven days. So you've got that seven-day period right up there at the top in the upper right. And we've now seen the rain begin and last for a period of 40 days. So this is kind of a preview. We're going to come back to this in a minute. But at this point then, we are, as I understand it, only 47 days into a flood event that will continue for just over a year. So we're just getting started on the flood. And again, we'll come back to this chart several times over the next few chapters uh, to help us make sense of the timeline. Because if we're just reading through chapters, it's hard for me to see this. Uh, but seeing it on a page or a screen like this, in my opinion, really helps. So let's go back and continue with Genesis chapter 7, verses 13 through 16. Genesis chapter 7, verses 13 through 16. On the very same day, Noah... And Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them, entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh, in which was the breath of life. Those that entered, male and female of all flesh, entered as God had commanded him. And the Lord closed it behind him. Notice in verse 13, we kind of jump back to when they were first getting on the ark. So you remember how I said earlier, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights? Kind of not quite yet. That was a preview of what we're looking at here. So this goes back to when they were first getting on the ark. We've got the names of Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so we've got Noah, Mrs. Noah, their three sons, and their sons' wives for a grand total of eight people on the ark. Other than the names, we don't have too much new information in this passage other than an interesting little tidbit down in verse 16 where we find that God is the one who closes the door. Have we spent any time thinking about that? If we were together, I would definitely ask, why is this significant? Why is it important that God closes the door. And why was it important that we know about this? Why is this in here? And obviously we're not given the reason in scripture, but it seems that this is here for a reason. And my assumption on this is that God didn't want this to fall on Noah. It would have been a huge burden to be the one to shut the door. Can we imagine being put in that situation? And I believe it was a burden that God did not want Noah to have to bear. He was a righteous man, and God said, I'm going to do this myself. That's the way I understand this. So God, therefore, takes this upon himself. He does not ask Noah to shut the door. Noah builds the ark. He gets everything ready, stocks it with food, water, whatever he needs or whatever. Uh, but the ultimately, the, uh, the closing of the door is something that God does himself. And if this is the case, if this is the reason... You know, I think we might be able to take this as something of a reminder that this really is not our burden today either. This is not our burden to bear. Today, our job is to teach and preach. Our job is to explain God's plan. Our job is not to make that final determination as to who is saved and who is lost. I mean, obviously, yes, we do make judgments based on behavior. Didn't Jesus say that we judge people by their fruits? 
A lot of people think Jesus said, never judge anything for any reason. That is not what he said. He gave some warnings about judgment. He urged us to be very cautious in judging others, reminding us that how we judge others is how we'll be judged ourselves. Uh, but there is a passage that indicates that we must judge with righteous judgment. He talked about inspecting people's fruits, basically. Um, you know, by your fruits, you will know who people uh, really are. And so, in other words, I can see someone's lifestyle and it's obvious to me, outwardly anyway, and I can make some judgment based on God's word that this is what needs to change here. Um, I can make the judgment that somebody needs to obey the gospel based on what you're telling me about what you've done. You haven't done this yet. You need to do it. God says to do it. Therefore, do it. You know, I can make that kind of a judgment. Uh, but the ultimate call as to whether someone is ultimately saved or lost, thankfully, that is not up to me. And it's not up to any of us. We don't make that decision. And I know sometimes today people will try to trap us in an argument of some kind. If you've been in those situations where we're teaching this, we're teaching the distinctive nature of the Lord's church, we're teaching the necessity of baptism and the understanding we have to have concerning the kingdom at the moment that we're baptized, and, and we're in this discussion with somebody and sometimes they'll throw that back at us and they'll say, oh, well, you think I'm going to hell, don't you? Have we ever heard that? I know I've heard that dozens of times. Or you just think I'm going to hell. Well, you know, ultimately, that that is not our call to make. We are not the ones making that decision. Our job is to explain what's necessary. Our job is to communicate the word of God. Uh, but thankfully, as was the case with Noah, um, God is the one who ultimately shuts the door. And of course, that uh, does not relieve us of anything. If anything, that makes it even more urgent. Um, we are like Noah in that we are preaching righteousness to a very evil age and time is of the essence and we don't need to be wasting time uh, with stuff that is not directly from the Bible. So we need to be very careful there. All right, let's conclude tonight with Genesis chapter 7 verses 17 through 24. Genesis chapter 7 verses 17 through 24. Then the flood came upon the earth for forty days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark, so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. The water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. The water prevailed fifteen cubits higher, and the mountains were covered. All flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind. Of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life died. Thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky. And they were blotted out from the earth, and only Noah was left, together with those that were with him in the ark. The water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. In the opening verses, we find that the rain continues for 40 days. And in that period of time, the water rises to the point where the ark is then lifted up off the ground. Uh, remember, as we discussed last week, this ark has no sail. Uh, there are no oars. There is no rudder. There is no way to propel it or direct it. Uh, no way to steer it whatsoever. Uh, but instead, all that it needs to do is float. And that is exactly what it does here. The water rises, and this giant barge, this ark, this ship, lifts up off the ground and starts floating. In verses 19 and 20, we find that the water continues rising, even until the high mountains are covered by 15 cubits of water. So 21, 22 and a half feet, something like that, depending on your measurement of a cubit. Uh, just enough so that everything on the earth is completely under the water. And I know some have wondered how this is possible. And it, they look at this and they say, ah, another another make-believe account from the Bible. Totally made up is what, uh, what we sometimes hear. Uh, but I think we do need to keep several things in mind. Number one, let's remember this is not just rain. This is not just raindrops falling on my head kind of situation, but if you remember earlier in this chapter, we learned that both the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were opened. In previous weeks, we've mentioned the water canopy over the earth, that idea that there were huge stockpiles of water stored in our atmosphere, protecting the human race from the harmful effects of the sun. And 
all of this is released, as I understand it here, according to Moses, as well as the fountains of the deep, underground storehouses of water. Even today, we know there, are, there is a whole lot of water under the earth that is uh, still there. But let's also, secondly, at least consider the possibility that mountains back then weren't quite as tall as mountains today. Um, even today, we know that mountains are a work in progress. Um, you know, you look at the earth, you can see the layers, you can see the plates, you can see how stuff has shifted, you can see it's been rather violent. And, and some were formed more violently and much faster than others. So I'm just mentioning here that it's at least possible that some mountains that we have with us today were not formed at this time or were not completely formed until after the flood. So let's just, we're, we're talking possibilities here. This is one possibility to consider. And then connected to this, just something else to note here. I think I read years ago that if the entire earth were completely flat, um, you know, totally on the same elevation. And so if we could raise up the ocean floors and push down every mountain peak until everything was at the same level that the earth would be covered with, I think it said 12,000 feet of water. And I'm not testifying to the accuracy of that figure. I'm saying I, I think we understand the concept uh, that the depths of the ocean are incredibly deep compared to the peaks that we see on this side of the ocean, if that makes sense. So if everything were to be level on this earth, um, the water that even we have today would cover absolutely everything very easily. So I'm just saying, even without the miraculous aspect of this, it is within the realm of possibility to have the entire earth covered in water. So it's not as strange as we might think. Well, this leads us to the second half of this passage where we find that everything dies. It all dies. Everything that breathes dies. And this is where we should just note the evidence that we see all around us today. When we find fossils today, we need to remember how fossils are made. As I understand it, thinking back to high school and college science courses, um, most fossils are made when they're covered catastrophically, we might say, by mud and then water. So if we illustrate this, if I find a dead squirrel out in my yard, and if I cover it up with just a few grains of dirt each day for thousands of years, would that make a fossil? If I find a dead animal in my front yard and bury it with a couple grains of dirt every other day or so, I mean, a lot of times people think that's how fossils are made, but if we think about it, what would happen if I did that? If I find a dead squirrel out front and start sprinkling dirt on it a tiny bit every day, it would be long gone. It'd be gone in a week or two. You got scavengers, you got rot and decay. It would disappear well before it ever fossilized. So how do we make fossils? Well, obviously, I think if we think back to science class, if it has any chance of being fossilized, that squirrel or any animal would have to be covered by copious amounts of mud. Suddenly, not a little bit at a time, but all at once, sealing that body off from decomposition and scavengers. There would be a lot of pressure bearing down on it. And I would just suggest this is exactly what happened in the flood. That is why we have so many fossils around us today. We've got a fossil in our state capitol. If you've been down to Cave of the Mounds down there by uh, Blue Mound State Park, you remember there's some kind of, I call it a squid. I think they had another name for it, but the, some, I, the squid splattered against the roof of the cave in southwest Wisconsin. How in the world did a squid end up pressed against the roof of a cave in southwest Wisconsin? Well, I have an idea, and I think it's tied to these verses that we've just read. So this is why we have fossils today. So when many scientists today suggest that some fossil is proven to be millions of years old, let's remember uh, there is another explanation for all of this. Uh, most scientists understand what we understand about how fossils are made, but they have some unique explanations of their own. Uh, on a regular basis, scientists, archaeologists will discover large groups of fossilized animals together. It'll make the news every few years. And um, and they'll often speculate, you know, very scientific sounding conversation here. Wow, this herd of animals was crossing a flooded river. And wouldn't you look at that? We got 200 elephants all, all fossilized here together because they all tried to cross this river and they, they drowned and they got covered in mud. Does that happen? Um, you know, there is another explanation for that. And I believe we have it right here in verses 21, 22, and 23. And that is, in the flood, every breathing thing drowned. 
and the bodies settled in and were covered by debris as the floodwaters subsided. And this most likely also uh, explains vast deposits of oil and gas, huge quantities of animals and vegetari uh, vegetation were uh, buried by the flood. And I know we could go on and on with this, but I think the point for us to note at this point is that everything dies and water continues to prevail upon the earth for 150 days. And for this, before we end, let's just go back very briefly to the chart. I've highlighted the 150 day period on the right hand side of the chart here. And we need to remember that after the 40 days of rain, with the fountains of the great deep bursting open, the floodgates of the sky being opened, um, this amount of water doesn't just disappear overnight, does it? So we have 40 days where the waters are rising, just gushing in from above and below, followed by 110 days where the waters prevail upon the face of the earth, at least as Moses describes it here. So this prepares us for uh, our study of chapter 8 next week, if the Lord wills, as we will look at the waters start to recede, and then the ark resting on the mountains of Ararat. So if you want to study ahead, certainly that would be appropriate. Next week we'll be looking at Genesis chapter 8. So that brings us to the end of our study tonight. I hope you can be with us next week as we study chapter 8. But thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of creation, but you are also a God who weeps over sin, and you are a God who destroys when necessary. Thank you, Father, for always providing a way of escape, for providing a way of salvation, and thank you for putting us in your Son's body, the Church. Thank you for saving us, and we pray that, like Noah, we might also be known as being preachers and teachers of righteousness, and we pray that when the end comes, at the very least, we would at least be joined by the members of our own family. Help us, Father, as we look for others who are interested in, uh, in your message. In Jesus we pray. Amen.